the one we are going to introduce in Joki. The Brave Eldest Son is Sabotai. If you have not yet watched Joki, The Brave Eldest Son, you are welcome to click the link to appreciate it. Next, we are going to tell the story of Sabotai, the Taro Head of the Empire. The exciting content is about to begin. Please stay tuned. Sabotai family were hereditary slaves of the Wuliang High Clan. And Sabotai always knew that his fate should not be so. In the summer of 1182, he decided to break the shackles and pursue his own freedom and ambition. He abandoned the Wuliang High Clan and joined Temujin, the then leader of the Mongolian Kiet Clan, due to his bravery. In 1189, he became the Torhaik, personal bodyguard of Genghis Khan. His bravery and wisdom were recognized by Genghis Khan, and he became a member of his elite middle army. His Nuka, along with Jelm, Jeeb and Kable, they were known as the Four Brave Warriors. However, Sabotai was not arrogant or complacent. He maintained a humble attitude and strong determination when he first served as a captain. He accompanied Genghis Khan to fight against the Karite tribe and annexed the Naaman tribe, unifying the tribes in the northern desert in 1206. When the flag of the Great Mongol Empire was raised on the endless grassland, Many warriors were proud of this, Genghis Khan, the founder of this great country, decided to honor those loyal and brave generals. Sabotai, once a slave, a burden-bearing, ambitious warrior, was appointed one of the 95,000 households. At that moment, everyone on the grassland cheered and jumped for joy in honor of Sabotai honor and his unparalleled perseverance, his position on the grassland and the power he gained made people respect him even more and fear him even more, he was no longer a slave, but a great leader, an invincible warrior. Between 1211 and 1215, the conflict between the Mongol Empire and the Jin Dynasty reached a climax, Sabotai, now a renowned general in the Great Mongol Empire, was chosen as one of the main commanders of this campaign. A critical battle broke out in Wanzhou in 1212. The Jin soldiers were nervously guarding the city walls, and Sabotai led his Mongolian army, crossing the plains spreading to the horizon. Heading straight for the city, he rode on his tall horse, waving his sharp sword. Leading his army like a storm, the Mongolian soldiers broke through the city gate at an astonishing speed and rushed into the city. Sabotai was the first to climb the city wall and planted his Mongolian flag on it. His soldiers cheered his name and his victory was instantly spread throughout the battlefield. In 1217, Sabotai chose his next campaign, which was to chase the remnants of the Merkit tribe fleeing west of the Ural Mountains. He personally applied to Genghis Khan for this expedition and immediately began strategic deployment. During the march, Sabotai cleverly used psychological tactics. He ordered his lieutenant, Ari, to lead a group of soldiers equipped with baby carriages to move ahead. And they would deliberately leave the baby carriages behind when camping at night, as if they were a driven refugee team. When the Merkit scouts saw these left behind baby carriages, they would believe that Sabotai troops were a powerless group of refugees, not a rapidly marching, well-equipped army. In this way, Sabotai army advanced unimpeded to the Chu River. The Merkits were unprepared for the arrival of the Mongol army. Sabotai decisively launched an attack, defeated the enemy, and wiped out the Merkit tribe in one fell swoop, according to the collection of histories by the Persian. Historian Rashid Daldin, Sabotai faced a new challenge in the battle against the Merkit leader Hodu. At that time, Sultan Ayla ad-Din Muhammad II of the Khorosmian Empire had already led his army to station in the area east of the Sia River. For this new threat, Genghis Khan had once given a clear order to Sabotai, if encountering the Khwarazmian army, they should avoid them and not conflict with them. However, Muhammad II did not intend to miss this opportunity. He led his own army to attack Sabotai, faced with such a sudden attack. Sabotai was forced to respond, he led his own army in a fierce battle with the Khwarazmian forces. The result was astonishing. Sabotai successfully defeated the Khwarazmian army, not only achieving the purpose of defense, but almost capturing Muhammad II. The victory in this battle earned him the reputation of a warrior. In 1219, 
Sabotai went on a western expedition with Genghis Khan's army, following the steps of the campaign. They entered the distant western regions and launched relentless attacks on the cities and dynasties there in the spring of 1220. They attacked the important city of Samarkand. But when they were about to break through the city walls, Sultan Muhammad II of the Khorosmian Empire chose to flee under the command of Genghis Khan. Sabotai and Jid quickly organized a pursuit team. They followed Muhammad's footsteps, crossed the Mudaya, and chased him to Nishapa. There they decided to part ways with Jeeb. Sabotai led his troops to cities like Isfahan, Dangan, Simnan, and Ray. They chased Muhammad throughout Khorasan, leaving him nowhere to run, eventually forcing him to flee to a small island in what is now the Caspian Sea, however. Almost at the same time, Muhammad died of illness, ending his fugitive life. After achieving complete victories throughout Khorasan, the armies of Sabotai and Jeeb did not stop. They turned their battles to Persia and marched to countries such as Azerbaijan and Georgia. Their cavalry swept the earth like a storm and cities like Herat, Simnan, Zanjan, Yazvan, Hamadan, Nahavand, Shushtar, Ardobil, and Gorkan were not spared. The magnificent city walls were breached. The splendid palaces became ruins, the rich land was ravaged, and the once vibrant city became devastated. The land was dyed red with blood in front of the armies of Sabotai and Jeep. The defensive forces of these cities were as fragile as paper, and their resistance only added to the cruel outcome. Their war horses rushed like beasts, and the arrows were dense like a gale, ruthlessly leveling all enemies in front. In early 1221, the capital of Georgia, Tbilisi, was plunged into a battle of life and death. The protagonists of this battle were Sabotai and Jeep. To great generals of the Mongol Empire, they led thousands of Mongol warriors. Determined to include this city at the crossroads into the territory of the Mongol Empire, the battle was fierce and bloody, but in the end, the cunning tactics and indomitable spirit of the Mongol army overcame the Georgian army. Sabotai and Jeeb's armies broke the Georgian defense line in one fell swoop, changing the fate of this city. After the battle, Sabotai and Jeeb did not rest. Their sights had already turned to further places. It was said that they intended to march to Baghdad, the capital of the Abbasid dynasty, trying to include the entire Middle East into the territory of the Mongol Empire, however. For some reason, they chose to go north later. In the spring of 1222, a fierce war broke out on the plains of Georgia. The protagonists of this battle were still Sabotai and Jeep. To great generals of the Mongol Empire, their opponents were the experienced and powerful Georgian army. According to the history collection, Jeeb had made a meticulous deployment before the war. He led 5,000 elite troops and hid in a secret place, waiting for Sabotai to lead the main army to lure the Georgian army. Sabotai confronted the Georgian army and a fierce battle began. At first, Sabotai army was somewhat powerless and retreated. The Georgian army saw the Mongol army retreat and mistakenly thought that victory was in sight. So they pursued them in a line. At this time, Jeeb, who had been lurking for a long time, suddenly led his army out from the hiding place, forming a pincer attack with Sabotai army. The Georgian army was caught off guard and fell into chaos. In the end, under the fierce attack of the Mongolian army, 30,000 Georgian soldiers were annihilated. The victory in Georgia brought Jeeb and Sabotai more confidence and courage. Their fighting will became more determined. So they looked at further places. They led the Mongol army to the west, with the target set on Durbant. After reaching Durbant, they found that the towering Caucasus mountains blocked their way. But these high mountains did not make them stop. Jeeb and Sabotai decided to excavate the rocks and open a passage. After completing this arduous task, the Mongol army successfully crossed the Caucasus Mountains and entered the North Caucasus region. Here they encountered the joint resistance of the local Alans and Kipchaks. However, Jeeb and Sabotai showed high wisdom. They sent people to inform the Kipchaks, saying, We are actually from the same tribe and the Alans are our enemies. We should not invade each other. And gave the Kipchaks many treasures, trying to clear their hostile relationship with them. 
The Kipchaks believed it to be true. So they withdrew their troops after the Kipchaks withdrawal. The Mongolian army easily defeated the Helens, then turned to attack the undefended Kipchaks, smashing them in one fell swoop and taking back the treasures they had given them. After the defeat of the Kipchaks, their tribal leader, Kutani, led the remaining forces to his son-in-law, Duke Mstislav the Old of Gallic. Kutani asked the Duke for help, hoping he could send troops to help resist the Mongolian invasion. Duke Mstislav the Old accepted this request and successfully convened all the princes of southern Rus to meet in Kiev, where they decided to unite against the Mongols at the conference. As a result of this meeting, Duke Mstislav the Old and Grand Prince Mstislav III of Kiev led an army of 80. Zero to confront the Mongolian army. But they didn't anticipate the tactics of Mongolian generals Jiban Sabotai. Jiban Sabotai adopted the strategy of feigning retreat, luring the Ruskipchuk coalition forces to pursue them for 12 consecutive days. During the pursuit, the Ruskipchuk coalition was exhausted. After 12 days of feigning retreat, the Mongolian army suddenly turned around and launched a large-scale attack. The battle broke out near Mariupolio on the Kalmius River, resulting in a decisive victory for the Mongolian army, forcing the Rus coalition to scatter and flee. Grand Prince Vostislav III and his troops, after three days of stubborn resistance, were allowed by the Mongolian army to surrender, however. The moment they turned around to surrender, they were all killed. After defeating the Rus and Kipchak coalition forces, Jiban Sabotai army continued its large-scale conquest. Their forces entered the Crimean Peninsula, launching a looting war on the Sudak, including the wealth of the Genos Republic's merchants, continuing their conquest. Their forces then attacked the Bulgarian Khanate on the Volga River to the east, again winning. After that, their army turned southeast and successfully subdued the Kangli people in the Ural region. After a series of victories, their army's reputation echoed across the steppes. After completing this series of conquests, their army, traversing the steppes north of the Sir Darya, joined forces with Genghis Khan's Mongol Grand Army. All of this happened in the spring of 1225. By the time their forces returned to Karakoram, they had won countless honors and victories. For Sabotai outstanding performance in the Western Expedition, Genghis Khan greatly appreciated him and awarded him with precious pearls and a silver ewer to commend his military exploits. These were very precious gifts, symbolizing that his contributions and value were deeply recognized by Genghis Khan. Sabotai wisdom and insight were far beyond his martial skills. When he reported to Genghis Khan that he had released a Kipchak slave, who had denounced his master, Genghis Khan commented, a slave who is not loyal to his master. Will he be loyal to others? Upon hearing this, Sabotai sentenced the slave to death, once again demonstrating his deep understanding of loyalty. Furthermore, Sabotai, in order to better organize and manage the war, proposed to Genghis Khan to unite the thousands of households of the Merkut, Naaman, Karat, and Kipchak tribes into one army. This suggestion was also approved. When Genghis Khan was preparing to invade the Western Jir, knowing that Sabotai had been serving abroad for a long time, he commanded him to temporarily return home to visit his parents. But Sabotai, with great loyalty and reverence, firmly requested to continue accompanying Genghis Khan on his expedition. Seeing his determination, Genghis Khan ordered him to cross the Great Gobi Desert. In 1226, Sabotai demonstrated his bravery and wisdom, successfully capturing the tribes of Serai Wudu's Jin, Simon, and others, as well as the states of Deshan, Ron, Lan, Hu, Tao, and He. After the war, he was awarded 5,000 mares as a reward. However, the following year, when Sabotai learned of the death of Genghis Khan, he decided to return immediately. Obviously deeply affected by this news, for a general so loyal and with such deep affection for Genghis Khan. This was undoubtedly a huge blow. The wind was cold, and in the early spring of 1229, the Mongolian Empire was undergoing a power transition that would change the course of history. At the climax of the ceremony, Genghis Khan's third son, Gagedai, slowly took the Khan's seat, officially becoming the new great. Khan of Mongolia, 
Gagedai, the new ruler who had just inherited power, had eyes like burning flames when his gaze swept across the hall. Everyone felt his boundless ambition and bravery taking over the Khan's scepter. He first made a significant political arrangement, betrothing his precious daughter, Princess Tungan, as beautiful as moonlight, to the brave Sabotai, the wedding of Princess Tungan. And Sabotai was grandly held in the spring breeze, under all eyes. She smilingly placed her husband's large hand on her heart, their heartbeats resonating harmoniously in the soft spring wind. This was not just a wedding, but a symbol of loyalty and power symbolizing to lie an alliance between Gagedai and Sabotai, not long after the wedding. Gagedai decided to launch another expedition, this time targeting the Jin dynasty in the south. He swung his scepter at the meeting, loudly declaring his intent for war. And for a moment, the entire empire was shaken by his power. Among all the generals, Sabotai stood at the forefront, donned in battle armor, standing firm as a rock, with eyes sharp as a hawk. He was to become the leader of the army once again, his courage, wisdom, and loyalty would once again serve as the driving force for the Mongol army. The sunlight of the year 1230 cast a shadow over a battle. That would change history. Sabotai, hailed as the god of war of the Mongol Empire, was fully committed to the Battle of Tungguan. Despite his fierce battle and strategic wisdom, he and his Mongolian cavalry were never able to break through this solid barrier. The news of failure was like a thunderbolt exploding. Beside the year of Okadai Khan, his face once fell into deep shadows, and he blamed Sabotai with a heavy heart. But his anger was appeased in front of his equally brave brother, Tolui. Tolui sat in front of Okadai, his steadfast eyes looking at his elder brother, he said. Victory and defeat, a common place for soldiers, elder brother. Please give Sabotai a chance to atone. Ogadai looked at his brother, took a deep breath, and finally agreed to his request. Starting from the spring of 1231, Sabotai fought under Talu. Transitioning from a chief to a member of the army, he led the right-wing army to first take down Fengxiong Mansion, then moved south to Baji, entered De Sangwen, and then turned to Fengzhou, Yongzhou, Xingyuan, Jinzhou, and Fengzhou in the southern Song dynasty, like a hurricane, they raced leaving behind earth-shattering battles and destruction wherever they went. Then Sabotai led Tami across the vast Hon River, northward. With its spearhead pointed directly at Beyonjing, his armor shone in the sun. His eyes were brilliant, and his body was filled with determination and courage. He knew that he was heading towards a battle that would change his destiny on a bright winter day. Tolui and Sabotai completed a stunning right-wing strategic flanking maneuver paving the way for the next battle. Ogadai Khan led the central army, illuminating the cold yellow river like an aurora, successfully crossing the Baipo in Hichin County in the first lunar month of 1232. The army he led was as fierce as a lion, and it took down Zhengzhu to feast, forming a pincer attack with Tolui and Sabotai, directly pointing at Bianjing. However, Wanyan Haider, the elite of the Jin Kingdom, led the Jin army to the south, attempting to intercept Tolui, but ultimately failed. He was commanded by Emperor Aizong of Jin to turn northeast to aid Bianjing, but the fist of fate was already shaky, just as the Mongolian army was marching. To the northwest of Junzhou Sanfeng Mountain, the winter wind and snow surged like a wild herd, and the Jin soldiers surrounded the Mongolian army with several times their strength. But the courage and resilience of the Mongolian soldiers became even stronger in this harsh weather, under the cover of wind and snow. They resolutely launched an attack, defeated the Jin army, and shattered their morale. The news of the Jin army's disastrous defeat was like frozen rain, splashing on the face of Emperor Aizong of Jin, the original force, known as 350,000, was almost completely annihilated and the elite of the Jin army was completely lost from this. Point on, in the quiet of the night, the moonlight shone on the tent. To generals, Tolui and Sabotai sat by the fire, discussing how to deal with Wanyan Hedda's army. The fire illuminated their faces. Firm and full of wisdom, at that time, they didn't know that this conversation would change their destiny. What is your strategy, Sabotai? Tolui asked, his eyes bright. 
his tone firm, Sabotai smiled slightly, exuding confidence, and said, Those who guard the city cannot bear hardships. We challenge them repeatedly, make them tired, and then we can win the battle. After Sabotai entered the city, he saw the broken walls and the desolate streets, the once prosperous city was now in ruins, and the people's lives were extremely difficult. His heart was filled with a mix of victory and melancholy, but as a general, he knew that there was no room for sentimentality on the battlefield. He ordered his soldiers to refrain from indiscriminate killing and maintain order within the city. In the following days, Sabotai and his troops began the process of pacification, restoring order, and re-establishing governance in the city. They repaired the damaged city walls, roads, and other infrastructure, and also ensured the safety and well-being of the civilians. He also dispatched envoys to other cities in the region, signaling their victory and establishing Mongol authority. Sabotai humane treatment of the defeated city and its residents gained him great respect from both his own troops and the local population. His sense of justice and righteousness, as well as his ability to reconcile with the defeated, made him a revered figure in the annals of Mongol history. After the capture of Bionji, Sabotai returned to Ogadai Khan with the spoils of war. His victory greatly boosted the prestige of the Mongol Empire and significantly expanded its territories. In the years that followed, Sabotai continued to lead his troops in various campaigns, further strengthening the might of the Mongol Empire and solidifying its rule over vast territories. His name would forever be etched in the pages of history as one of the greatest generals in the war. However, in his heart, Sabotai always remembered the words of his companion, Tolui. Victory and defeat were commonplace for soldiers, but it was important to remain loyal and devoted to their duty. These were the principles that Sabotai lived by, and they were the principles that guided him throughout his illustrious military career. In the end, the fall of Bianjing marked the end of the Jin dynasty and the rise of the Mongol Empire. Sabotai's strategies and leadership had played a significant role in these historical events, leaving a deep and lasting impact on the world. He ordered the residents of the city to cross the Yellow River to the north, seeking chances of survival through food gathering. The people of Bianjing instantly plunged into tumult, carrying their grief and despair as they began to move towards the unknown north. After Sabotai and his army gained complete control of Bianjing, Emperor Aizong of Jin fled from Gidi to Keijo, he carried the dignity of his nation and people, continuing to survive amidst the pursuit of the Mongolian army. In the early spring of 1234, Keijo, the last stronghold of the Jin dynasty, was under the attack of the Mongolian and Song armies. Though Sabotai was not on the front line, his strict command and control contributed to the decisive victory of the Mongol-Song alliance. Emperor Aizong had no escape route and chose despairingly to hang himself. With his sigh, the Jin dynasty fell into ruins. Subsequently, in 1235, Gaget Icon ordered princes such as Bachi, Gaik, and Menki to march westward. Due to Sabotai's ability to recognize military opportunities and his bravery in battle, he was chosen as the vanguard. Upon hearing the news, the Khwarezmian minister Barshuk apparently feared Sabotai's reputation so much that he hurriedly escaped into the Caspian Sea resulting in his wife and children being captured by the Mongol army and presented to the court. As time progressed into the winter of 1236 to 1237, the Mongolian princes stationed their troops in the Caban River Valley. Sabotai was once again sent to the land of Bulgaria and Alans. Soon after, the princes also marched out, forming an unprecedented force by the end of 1237. The Mongolian troops appeared on the Rus border near Bulgaria. The Mongolian army led by Bachu and others suffered a setback in their battle with the Rus Prince Yaroslav Sevolodovic, and their siege of Torzok was unsuccessful. However, when Sabotai appeared on the battlefield, the situation immediately changed. He seized Torzok and captured Yaroslav Sevolodovic after a fierce three-day battle. In the end, the Mongolian armies further incorporated the principalities of Gallic, Vladimir, and the regions of Alans, Kipchak, Burtis, and Moldova under their rule. 
at the end of 1240, when the Grand Duke of QIV resolutely refused to surrender, Sabotai issued an attack order. A formidable force swept through QIV like a hurricane, and the city eventually became ruins under the Mongolian onslaught, subsequently in 1241. Batu and Sabotai led the main Mongol forces across the Carpathian Mountains. Setting their sights on the Kingdom of Hungary, Sabotai, as the vanguard, joined forces with Batu, Kaden, and other princes to form a five-pronged attack with his brilliant strategies. Sabotai successfully lured the numerically superior Hungarian army to the Sodjo River. They quietly built rafts to cross the deeper parts of the river, aiming to flank the enemy from behind. Meanwhile, at the shallow sections, the princes had already initiated combat on the bridges after a whole night of river crossing. At dawn, they launched a surprise attack on the Hungarian camp from all sides, causing heavy casualties, encircled by the Mongol army. The Hungarian forces desperately fled westward but could not escape the Mongolian onslaught. After successfully crossing the river, the princes, considering the vast numbers of the Hungarian army, proposed to halt temporarily, however. Sabotai insisted, saying, if you want to go back, go by yourselves. I will not return until we reach Budapest, in the end. The Mongolian army successfully conquered Budapest, and Hungary was devastated. More than 70,000 people died, with only King Bela IV lucky enough to escape. Later, Batu criticized Sabotai for his slow river crossing operation at the Sodjo River. But after Sabotai explained the reasons, Batya understood. Later at a gathering, Batya gave Sabotai wine and mare's milk and gave a fair evaluation of the Hungarian campaign, saying, all the gains made were thanks to Sabotai. In the summer of the same year, Sabotai and others began to consolidate Mongol control over Hungary and other parts of Eastern Europe, planning to attack Central Europe in the autumn in 1242. The news of Gagedai Khan's death reached the Western Expedition's front lines, prompting the expeditionary forces to pack up and start returning to Mongolia. At this critical moment, Batu, as a senior member of the royal family, heard that Norman intended to support Gaik, with whom he had disagreements, as Great Khan. Batu chose to stay in Eastern Europe and establish the Golden Horde, using his illness as an excuse and ordered Sabotai and the princes to continue marching east with the troops. By 1246, Sabotai returned to his camp at the Tula River immediately after attending the enthronement. Ceremony of Gaik Khan and stayed there until his death in 1248 at the age of 73. Sabotai, with his iron fist approach and sophisticated military strategy, led the Mongolian army on a westward expedition. He not only made outstanding contributions in wars, but also made significant contributions to the stability and development of the country. His life was full of challenges and changes, but he remained steadfast and unwavering, whether on the battlefield or in the construction of the nation. He maintained calmness and determination, adapting to changes without changing himself, even in the last moments of his life. He never forgot his devotion to the country and loyalty to the people. If you like this story, please help us by subscribing and sharing. Thank you.